That's kind of conversation between the soul. That's conversation between the soul and the night. Hello, Prestige Head, uh, and welcome to another special episode on Ukraine from American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with Derek Davison. Um, so there's been a lot going on in Ukraine, particularly uh, the, today when we're recording uh, Friday, February 18th, uh, U.S. time. So Derek, why don't you just let everyone what's, uh, ever let everyone know what's been going on? Uh, yeah, so I mean, after we recorded yesterday's, uh, we, we recorded the episode yesterday on, on um, February 17th. Uh, and I had mentioned that there were a lot of reports of shelling along the front line in eastern Ukraine. Uh, one particular image of a school kindergarten room that had been hit by a shell and the wall was caved in was very dramatic. Um, th this will be relevant in a bit, but uh, I think it's important to note that uh, the this Donbass separatists and the Russian government seem to suggest that uh, that attack in particular had taken place on the rebel side of the border, but in fact it had taken place on the Ukrainian side of the, or not border, the front line, uh, but in fact it had taken place on the Ukrainian government side of the front line. So that's that, that's something to bear in mind as we uh, get into some of this. Um, what happened on Friday was basically for most of the day more of the same reports of multiple violations, uh, you know, and there are there have been violations uh, of the ceasefire along the front line for years now at a fairly, you know, uh, routine level. But what's happened over the last couple of days has been dramatically escalated. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe says it uh, recorded, I think, around 600 reports of violations just on Thursday. So that's a drastically escalated uh, level of, of uh, activity. Um, and it seems to have continued into Friday. So that was most of the day was was these uh, ceasefire violations something you know seems like something maybe brewing maybe not uh, but troubling nonetheless uh, but by Friday evening things took a really weird turn I mean Friday evening local time um, when the governments the leaders of the unrecognized Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, the two uh, breakaway governments in the Donbass region, uh, each ordered a full evacuation uh, of their civilian populations across the border into Russia, citing claims that the Ukrainian military was about to roll in and uh, do all sorts of nasty things. Uh, this was this claim was bolstered, I guess, somewhat by uh, um, what appears to have been a car bombing in Donetsk near the DPRs, the Donetsk People's Republic's uh, kind of government office building in that city. There were no casualties, and I think that may be relevant in terms of uh, who actually placed the explosives on this car. It seems a little peculiar, um, but. Basically, uh, these these videos were released. Uh, I don't know how many people have actually evacuated. I have no information on that at this point. Um, the videos. So, the, and here's where we get into sort of the well. We can get into that in a minute. What the Russian government responded with, you know, uh, expressions of concern over the the heightened uh, level of shelling and artillery and ceasefire violations, of course, blaming that all on the Ukrainian side. Uh, humanitarian uh, icon Vladimir Putin uh, issued orders to his government to, to accommodate all the needs of any evacuating Donbass residents, which could be hundreds of thousands of people if they all uh, kind of heed these warnings to flee into Russia. So and There's a uh, genuine full evacuation, as uh, has been ordered by the two governments yeah if it if it actually if it actually happens and, and all of the people in in those regions uh do it follow those those evacuation orders it could be hundreds of thousands of people uh and vladimir putin as we all know is a, a great humanitarian uh anyway uh so that's i mean that's basically where things stand um and and you know we can we can talk about what actually may be happening, which I think may be a little bit different and what it all means. Uh, but so let's talk about it. What is actually happening? Because on the show, um, we've been skeptical that there's going to be an actual invasion, but it seems like the um, the the possibility of an invasion has increased in the last, you know, 24 hours. Is that accurate? So I, I think it's increased uh, in a way. And I, I think what's happening is, you know, if there was, 
I want to, you know, leave open the possibility that all of this is genuine, that the DPR and LPR really think that the Ukrainian military is about to roll through and uh, that all of this actually is, is uh, you know, the real thing. But I, I think that's a relatively small possibility. Uh, the car bombing strikes me as something that could be easily staged. Uh, metadata apparently taken from the evacuation video shows that they were recorded two days ago. So if that's accurate, either the leader of the DPR and the LPR have incredible powers to envision future events, uh, or they're they're making this up and, and they've been planning to to pull this for a couple of days at least, uh, if not longer. Uh, the so famous the, false flag, right? right which everyone promised, is worrying about. Yeah, the promised false flag attack that we've been you know uh, warned was coming. Um, that, uh, you know, again, I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of this is, except maybe as sort of the last, uh, pitch to Russians domestically for Putin that, look, I had to do this. There was this aggression. I had no choice. You know, if you're not, uh, if you were on the fence about intervening in Ukraine, here's the, you know, here's my, my final case for it. Yeah. Here's uh, a that, cause that for just sense. war. Yeah. Basically. Sure. Yeah. Um, so this, this looks like it may be, you know, very well be the attempt, uh, at a false flag. Now that said, um, I remain, uh, skeptical about the claims that we've heard over and over again for the last several weeks, which is, you know, there's going to be this lightning invasion of Ukraine, sieges of all the major cities. There was just a story in foreign policy. Policy uh, today that the U.S. Uh, says it has evidence that uh, Russia is planning like a mass arrest and execution campaign in Ukraine after it invades and conquers the entire country. I, I remain in the like I'll believe it when I see it camp uh, as far as those claims are concerned. What this I think does open the door to the events of Friday and and what I would be uh, concerned about now is. Uh, a limited Russian occupation, perhaps, uh, of the Donbass region. And this is, this is we're getting into territory that is, uh, you know, something we talked about last week, or I guess earlier this week, whenever we did that special episode. Um, the, the analogy to the 2008 war in Georgia, uh, we're starting to get into a place where, where there are some, some parallels to, to draw here, uh, potentially, with that conflict, which was also a somewhat limited Russian incursion to support breakaway republics in a, uh, in a state that was run by a border state that was run by a government that was somewhat adversarial to Russia or perceived and a as a former adversarial. Soviet Republic, yeah. former Soviet Republic, right. Um, and, and there were some extended, you know, there's some activity beyond the borders of those breakaway republics, airstrikes or artillery uh, in a limited way, but there was no full scale invasion. There was no occupation of Tbilisi or uh, attempt at regime change in Georgia. And that may be the model here that we've now uh, finally come to for Ukraine, at least uh, I, I'm I, I'm now in a position where I, I think you know that's that's a fairly strong possibility. Maybe if it's not you know uh, actually already happening, um, a lot of the what what happens next may depend on the response of the Ukrainian government. One of the things that uh, you know if you look at the 2008 war and you look, for example, at the European Union's final kind of summary report of that war, which I think actually was a fairly um, well, well done objective attempt to analyze what happened. Uh, they they pointed out in that document that while there had been provocations leading up to that conflict, and certainly you know Russia and its uh, allies in the those breakaway republics south of Syria and uh, Syria and uh, Abkhazia engaged in provocative acts leading up to the conflict, it was the Georgians who fired the first real shots uh, of that war. Um, and, you know, Mikhail Saakashvili was president of Georgia at the time, probably thought that he was going to get more backing, certainly was led to believe by the Bush administration, I think, at the time, uh, that he was going to get more support than he actually got. Uh, may have been feeling, you know, feeling his oats and and decided to to take some initiative. Uh, I think the Ukrainian government, it sounds like the Ukrainian government has learned a lesson from that conflict uh, and does not intend to take any initiative here. There, again, is no evidence of an imminent invasion of the Donbass, and, and they may sit back here and kind of watch things play out, which... Uh, you know, could could influence the course of events. I don't know, but but you know, if you're going to draw the 
the parallel as I'm trying as I'm I guess I'm doing now to the the Georgian War in 2008. That's what we're sort of waiting to see what happens now. So what do you think changed in terms of Putin's calculation? Why do you think um, that this looks like it might actually be similar to what happened in Georgia in 08? Um, I mean, I you know, I don't know that their calcula- that his calculation has changed. I mean, I've been thinking that that this was all you know meant to uh, as a warning, meant to sort of spark negotiation over uh, Ukraine. All the buildup. I, I mean, by by this, I mean all the buildup in uh, Western Russia. I don't know that you know. I mean, I could be could have been wrong about that the whole time. Maybe he's become dissatisfied over the course of the last several weeks that uh, his demands or concerns or whatever, however he would phrase it, are not being addressed uh, seriously by the West, and he feels like he needs to escalate things further. Um, maybe, you know, maybe they've been planning this all the time. Maybe the DPR and LPR have kind of nudged things forward uh, in some way or taken thing, you know, taken a little bit of initiative of their own to force Russia's hand. Um, any of these things is possible. Um, you know, I, I, I don't uh, pretend to have insight into Vladimir Putin's mind, which I, I know is, uh, you know, something that's sort of, uh, you're supposed to be able to do if you're a foreign policy analyst, but I, I really don't, uh, have any, any deep insights into his, uh, his psyche. So, um, it also seems like online, um, a lot of people, um, are, are saying something along the lines of, uh, people who, you know, claimed it wouldn't happen. Look, it's going to happen. How would you, how would you frame this? Because I think like it's important not only to focus on the actual foreign policy analysis, but because we're in the United States to focus on the discourse. So what do you see as happening in the discourse, particularly in relation to people like crowing about getting it right about Putin, that he's actually going to invade? Do you think that's accurate? Do you think it's an exaggeration? How would you frame uh, this? How, how should our listeners understand what's going on when they're you know reading the Times or scrolling through Twitter or whatnot? Yeah, so there's a couple of things about the discourse that I would I would say here. Um, one is that you are going to see people say, "Aha! Look, see, we told you all the time this was going to happen." Um, I think that's a little disingenuous. Um, this whole time, there has been a range of possible outcomes. Everything from the Russians say, "Okay, we're we're satisfied," and they pack up and go go home. They you know cut them the you know, bring all the all the uh, military assets back to base and everything goes back to normal uh, to a full scale regime change invasion, you know, World War Three type scenario. Um, one of those has been the idea of a limited Russian occupation of the Donbass or limited incursion. Uh, I think that the intermediate range of possibilities has gotten lost, and I'm guilty of it. I'm, uh, you know, I think we're guilty of it as much as anybody else, uh, but it's gotten lost in the um, drumbeat of, you know, they're going to surround Kiev, they're going to blast it and besiege it, it's going to be leveled, and then they're going to execute, you know, thousands of people for uh, being anti-Russia or whatever. And like this, this sort of maximalist uh, invasion talk, which I, I gather the Biden administration feels like they have to do or they, they want to do for whatever reason, whether it's just hyping, uh, whether it's, you know, for, for um, you know, more sordid reasons or because they really feel like um, this is, is affecting Russia's war plans, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that's been the, the beat that, that has been, you know, the steady beat that's been going on over and over again. And, and you sort of uh, lose as you, you know, whether you're, you're pushing that, that line or you're trying to counter it with the argument that, uh, you know, I, I really don't think they're going to do that. I don't think that's that's realistic. I don't see any signs of that happening. Um, either way, you sort of lose this range of, of intermediate possibilities and you start arguing uh, in a binary way. And I think that's what's happened here. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would I'd say it's just as fair to say that uh, you know, if you're going to say, oh, look, all the people who denied there was going to be any invasion, now, look, there is an invasion. It's just as fair to say that you've got a bunch of people who uh, insisted that there was going to be a total takeover of Ukraine that are now going to pivot to saying, uh, look, this is what we told you was going to happen all along, when in fact, what, you know, if what ha- if all that happens is Russia occupies the Donbass, which you could argue it's occupied since 2014, since started helping these uh, breakaway republics in the first place. Um, you know, that's that's a little unfair, a little disingenuous for, for that 
side of the argument to suddenly now say, uh, you know, this is what they've been predicting all along. Um, and so I actually want to uh, uh, end on this, but I think it's important. When you just said that you could argue that Russia has been occupying the Donbass since 2014, could you maybe just explain what exactly you mean by that? Because I think that we should be careful with our terms. Um, is this an invasion? Is this an occupation? Is it somewhere between? Is it an escalation of something that's kind of already been happening for about eight years? Or is it something different? So, I mean, it's, you know, you have, there's a fog of war sort of uh, problem to deal with here in that um, much like the early days after the Euromaidan protests, when uh, you had reports of kind of unmarked Russian military assets in Crimea uh, that were sort of plausibly deniable on the one hand, but seemed pretty, you know, pretty obviously to be a, a Russian incursion. And then, of course, Russia eventually just outright annexed Crimea and, and kind of pulled the scales away. Uh, it's a similar situation in the Donbass. I mean, the Russian government has clearly been and helping uh, the DPR and the LPR. It's provided military support. Um, it, it, it's probably put advisors or some kind of assets in that region. But can we say that for sure? Probably not. It's, it's a step below, uh, I think, for example, like the U.S. deployment in um, northeastern Syria, where you clearly have uh, a U.S. proxy alongside U.S. advisors or U.S. AIDS or whatever, how, whatever, however you want to term them, kind of squatting or occupying a, a, a part of Syria. Uh, I think you probably have a similar situation in the Donbass, but I can't say that to a to an absolute uh, certainty. So, I mean, if you want to call it um, an escalation, uh, if you want to call it um, kind of a reinvasion, if you want to call it an invasion, I'm not. You know, I don't. I don't know that I. Uh, I feel like I can parse uh, the terminology here uh, very well, but but certainly we can say since 2014, uh, Russia has been either occupying or, or sort of tacitly occupying the Donbas, or at least aiding uh, these two republics that that have separated themselves from the rest of Ukraine. Uh, and so let's end on this question. Uh, do you think we missed anything? Do you think that that we didn't um, predict anything? Because, you know, it's important, Derek, on American prestige to hold ourselves accountable. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering if you if you had uh, do we need to do a mea culpa or not really? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I do feel like uh, I need to do a mea culpa because I, I, I feel like I um, focus too. I've been focusing too much for the last several weeks on the claims of a, a full-scale invasion and trying to uh, say, you know, hold on a second, I don't think that's correct, or I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. Maybe we could, you know, uh, take a breath here for a second. Um, and and I have not uh, allowed for the possibility of something uh, less than that or something kind of uh, in an intermediate level. Um, it's, I mean, I've written about that from time to time at, um, in my newsletter, and I feel like, uh, you know, I didn't foreclose on it here on the podcast, but uh, I have probably allowed myself to get sucked into the total war talk just as much as anybody else. So I, I, I do feel like, you know, that was, uh, the, looking back, maybe I, I, I uh, got a little swept up in that. Well, Derek, I forgive you. Just never, ever, ever let it happen again. Um, <laughs> see, we on American Prestige hold ourselves accountable. Um, I think uh, that's it, unless you got anything to add, yes or no. Um, I mean, I, one thing that I would add to this, the discourse around Ukraine and Russia often turns on uh, this idea of uh, the far right in Ukraine, the far right uh, in Russia, you know, who's kind of, uh, is the U.S. kind of supporting neo-Nazi groups, the Azov Battalion and uh, right sector and those kind of kind of militias. And, and there are reasons to be concerned about uh, the far right's presence in Ukraine and the, the relationship between the United States as we're arming the Ukrainian military, which relies to a great extent on these paramilitary groups. And, uh, you know, are we arming um, basically neo-Nazi militias in Ukraine. And I think that's something to be uh, concerned about. But I, I think um, the bigger thing that I would say here is what what creates the environment or, you know, what sort of 
really fuels the far right in both countries. And Vladimir Putin has been, you know, a champion of far right governments all over the world. Uh, so Russia is not is not without its own problems in terms of uh, the far right. But what's really fueling the far right, I think, in both countries is this state of hostility. And so, uh, you know, I would say if that's your concern, then you should be looking for diplomatic solutions uh, to get out of this conflict short of uh, an invasion or occupation and, and ways to address uh, the fundamental underlying issues, which are Russia's concerns about uh, security, which is the Ukrainian, you know, the Ukrainian, most Ukrainian people's desire uh, not to be under Russia's thumb. There, there needs to be uh, an effort to, to solve these problems because even if there is a full-scale invasion or just an occupation of Donbass or nothing at all, uh, the underlying problems here aren't going to go away, and they're only few extremism uh, the longer that this this situation goes on. Derek, thank you very much, and we'll continue to update our listeners as things proceed. Talk to you later, man. Bye.